everyone, it's Ubonic Zombie. Welcome back to Along the Edge. So in the last episode, we got settled in our home. We explored a bit. We met, um, I guess what you can call the troublesome family, or at least the troublesome son of the Maltier family. And so um, we just finished talking to Miss, Mrs. Bourdain. So let's look at some picture albums. I found the pictures where Mrs. Bourdain told me they would be, to discover that my great-grandfather had had an early passion for the dark room, and that his photographs from the last century had survived time. The family was larger then, with a swarm of children in the gardens and large tables at the holiday gatherings. If I could read worry on the adults' faces, if the future ruin and dereliction of House Delatois could already crack the walls and yellow the wallpapers. It wasn't showing on these old derotypes. I found a couple of pictures of my mother, as a child first, then as a young girl. I must admit I was moved by this, this discovery, since I had never seen what she used to look like when she was younger. The last pictures show her belly getting rounder and rounder. And then, nothing. No more pictures, as if nothing worth documenting had happened during the last thirty years. Talking with Mrs. Bourdain aroused my curiosity. The tower, the village, the Maltairs, and I thought my relocation would mean living a life of austerity and isolation. What's going on in the village is, I must admit, much more intriguing than I had anticipated. Unfortunately, the chores of everyday life catch up with me before I have the leisure to think about it. I have no choice but to dedicate the last days of August to the preparation of my classes at the middle school, and I didn't realize how time-consuming it was. So I spend most of my time confined to the house, Boning up on the textbooks of each class I've been given. Then, the first day of school arrived and, after a couple of weeks, I finally found my bearings and days began to pass me like the trains. Chapter 2 September I've decided to take advantage of the weekend to go back to the market. I'm pretty sure someone will finally agree to tell me more than the tidbits I've gathered until now. Especially about this Maltaire family, which seems to mesmerize half the village, while the other half looks terrified by the mere mention of its name. I should start with the bakery. Mrs. Bolchard should be about to finish her season. She doesn't risk much in sharing some gossip, since she'll be leaving until the next summer. I make out Gerard Bortin on the other side of the square. He's talking to someone, a tall man with certain composure. I could walk to him so he introduced me, but the bakery is about to close and I might not get another chance to question Mrs. Bochard. What should I do? Okay, so, um, Mr. Bourdain, he lives on our property. So we can talk to him at any time and he can introduce us to people. I am going to opt to go to the bakery since this lady's about to leave. You know, it's kind of like, if you're willing, if someone's willing to tell you information, I would uh, take advantage of that while the, while the offer still stands. Hello, Miss Barchard. Ah, hello, Miss. You're in luck. I was about to close. You're finishing your season? Yes, I am. We stayed a bit longer than we anticipated, but that's it. We're leaving. Two weeks off and we're moving to the Alps, my husband and I. We're doing the ski season there. Oh, it's going to be quite a change. I can't say I'll miss the place. It paid quite well, but I don't like the atmosphere around here. So it'll be one bag yet, as usual. Sure, but I wanted to ask yes 
What do you know about the Maltairs? Told you, I don't like to talk about them. I don't want any trouble. Hmm. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to uh, impose on her if it makes her uncomfortable. Um, so I'm not going to, so I'm not going to say, but you'll be leaving soon. Kind of like, you know, well, you're leaving anyway. What's the harm? But, uh, I am curious what she's afraid of. What's the worst that could happen? What are you afraid of precisely? You seem like a fine young woman, so listen to me carefully. She takes me by the arm, puts her face close to mine, and whispers. The Maltair, they're sorcerers. That's how they told that's how they hold everyone in their grip. If you do something they don't like, bad things happen. How do you think I got this job? Bakers don't take a three months holiday. Mr. Blanchard, the owner of this shop, spent three months in the hospital, the poor soul. He fell all the way down his staircase. The other shopkeepers, they told me he had words with the mayor. What? The mayor? Well, sure. Yves Maltair. He's the mayor of the village. Didn't you know? No, I didn't. Apparently, they had a talk one evening, some pretty quarrel about the land register, a fence that wasn't at the right place or something, and then BAM! The next day, he falls down the stairs, just like that. But that's impossible. It must be a coincidence. This kind of thing can't be real. When it happens once, it's a coincidence for sure. When it happens every time someone goes against the Maltairs, Personally, I'm going to take this seriously, especially if this person is taking it, is takes it seriously. I'm not going to make light of it if it if it's something that terrifies them. Thank you for agreeing to talk to me. I'll be discreet. Don't worry. Well, if you know as much as I do now. Be careful around them. I wouldn't like it if something happened to you by my fault. Don't worry. Goodbye, Mrs. Belchard. Okay, so we got a bit of village lore there. I look around the square for Miss Bertine and this mystery man, but they seem to have left in the meantime. Too bad. Then, I shop around, asking about the Maltair while refilling my fridge at the same time. Unfortunately, now that I've been identified as the young heiress, the villagers have become mute, strangely polite and distant. As I bring my groceries back to the car, rain begins to fall. And it doesn't stop for the whole weekend and the start of the next week. I'm at school, teaching geometry to one of my classes when nature finally cares to give us the sun back. But my respite is short-lived when I discover, a bit later, a convocation to the director's office in my teacher's room locker. Even if I'm on the other side of the fence and I no longer risk detection, detention, I must admit I'm a bit worried, which adds a threatening feeling to this otherwise radiant summer day. When I venture inside the director's office, I discover that Mr. Chastanet, the director, is having a heated debate with someone who must be rather annoyed, mother of one of my pupils. The poor man is livid, using his desk as a shield, and he's so hunched up in his big leather chair that he seems to be about to melt into the upholstery. Jean Chassinet. Jean Chassinet. Ladies, Miss Levesque, you must admit that your demands are most unusual, to say the least. 
received nothing but praise on Miss Delatois' professionalism and her devotion to the teaching of mathematics. Ah, here she comes. Monsieur Chesnut stares at me with an imploring gaze as if I was his only hope. Did you ask for me? Yes, please, take a seat. Let me introduce you to Miss Levesque, mother of Jean-Baptiste. You know, your sixth grade student. Okay, so... Who do we direct our attention to? So he's introducing us, so... Um, it'd be polite to speak to her first. Hello, Miss Leves. Pleased to meet you. I'm Daphne Delatois, Mrs. Dupy's substitute. I'm pleased to tell you I don't have anything to say against your son or his work. He's a brilliant student. Beatrice Levesque. Are you kidding me? You must have guessed I haven't come to hear praises about my son's skills in mathematics. Listen, Mr. Chastanet. I'd rather not talk to this... this... Anyway, we came to an understanding, you and I, and I hope you'll keep your word. Jean-Baptiste's mother tries to stare me down. From the corner of my ear, I hear the director mutter in his beard. But I didn't agree to anything. I don't know how to deal with this situation. After a couple of very long seconds, I give up and say... What is the problem? I'm sure we can find a solution. How to tell you this? Madame Levesque would like to remove her son from your class. Uh, my first response would be if I did something. Um, you know, because you, you want to know. So I'm going to ask if I did something wrong. I... I don't understand. Everyone seems happy with the way I work. Why would you want to remove your son from my class? This has nothing to do with your teaching. Mrs. Levesque, be reasonable. You can't ask us to change the classes like that. For no good reason. For no good reason? Ah, that's it. You're, you, you two are falling under the Delatois spell. This family of pagan miscreants! You've just arrived here, and like that, you should get away with anything? But I, I see clearly through your game, and I won't be fooled like the others. Do you want me to tell you what you are? A witch! Let's see my options here to do with this. It may be unwise to make me angry then. Calm down. I wish you no harm. Um, it's between the first and the third option. Like, I have nothing to do with this or, you know, I'm not going to hurt you. Um, hmm... So if I, if I was in this situation and someone accused me of witchcraft, sure, I would deny I have nothing to do with it, but if the person already feels threatened, if they're already convinced that I'm a witch and I'm no good, then at least I would like to set a boundary saying like, hey, I'm not going to hurt you. So I'm going to say, calm down, I wish you no harm. Please, madame, calm down. I assure you that I wish you no harm to your son or to you. It's not my fault if my family name has a reputation in the area. I would gladly keep on talking when Mr. Chastanet cuts in to stop the discussion. See? I was sure that we would come to a consensus in the end. I hope your fears are lifted, Miss Levesque. 
And you, Miss Delatoire, I advise you to be careful about the progress of our dear Jean-Baptiste. Can I count on you? Of course, sir. I assure you. What? Ah, you're in league together. There's no other explanation. You, the Delatoire, you won't get away with it. I'm not done with you yet. You hear me? Then, without notice, she gets out and slams the door behind her. There's an awkward silence, quickly broken by Jean Chesinet. Third time she bursts into my office, just for this. This nonsense! I believe I owe you one, Daphne. Let's see, you really have a nerve. Um, I'm not sure of the context saying you really have a nerve. Or it's my job. Hmm. You know what? I think in this contest, I um, it'll be a compliment. So I'm gonna owe it to him for putting up with that. That's not easy to. Put. It's not easy to be. I I think this is the principal. If it is, I, I. It's not easy being a principal of a school. Oh, I think that I think that was a case of me accusing him like you have some nerve to bring that on me. Next time, please try not to ambush me. Oh yeah, that was insulting him. Whoops, did not mean to do that. It's not my place to do your job. To be fair, that's true, but I personally would not have told him that. But he's just trying to stay neutral and appease both sides, so I can see where he's coming from. When I finally managed to get out of the college, it's almost dark and rain is pouring down again. As if today's events hadn't annoyed me enough. Seriously, how could this woman smear my family name like that? I know that the Delatois have somewhat of a reputation in the area, but to call me a witch to my face. At my workplace? Even if I had any magical powers, how could she think I would do any harm to a child? It's really appalling. I've lived out of a cigarette and I'm brooding, sitting by the window. When suddenly, I see the headlights of a car in the road in the road bend. I'm surprised to see a turn at the gates and go up the path to the house. Who could come see me this late? I think I recognize this dirty gray van with the ladder on its roof and its patched up back view mirror. How is it possible? Why would he have come here? I run down the stairs. I open the front door. Frank? My ex-lover is here, on the other side of the threshold, drenched by the relentless rain. My heart goes down to my socks at the idea of seeing him, talking to him once again, just when I had resigned myself to the fact that he was but a remnant of the past. Happy, at first, then not so much. How did he know? How did he find me? I haven't even told him I was leaving. Daphne? How long do you plan on letting me wait? Outside, in the rain? We have to talk. But, but what are you doing here? Frank is in the hall, and he's a little bit annoyed. I'm fine, thanks for asking. I know we broke up, but I don't know. Did it even cross your mind to call me to let me know you were relocating to the other side of the country? I mean... I mean what? Tell me!
know what? If I'm trying to get away from this guy and I'm not getting good vibes from this. So I'm just <laughs> bluntly, none of your business, dude. It's none of your business anymore. You said so yourself. We broke up. All right. Then why do I still get your mail? Care to explain? My mail? Yes, a letter from your mother. I know you've drifted apart, so I thought it might be important. And then I had to track you down, and it wasn't exactly child's play. It would have been easier if you had left me your new address. Since I'm between jobs, I told myself I could take a couple of days off. Frank smiled at me, looking amused. Then, pretending to check out the room, he adds, Funny, I've always dreamed to spend a week in a bed and breakfast, or should I say a castle and breakfast? Don't laugh at me. You know it's not my style, style to pretend to be a chantelaine. Really? I think being a baroness suits you very well. You mind if I call you Lady Daphne from now on? Stop kidding. What, don't you like Baroness? What about Count Countess or Duchess? Mmm, Duchess sound perfect, don't you think? Frank is walking around the hall, checking out the furniture and the trinkets. If he's good at anything, he's probably at disarming any tense situation. Do you mind if we talk tomorrow? I have to admit, I'm exhausted. He says that. He takes a letter from his chest pocket, puts it on top of the chest in the hall. Your mother's letter. I'm sure it's not easy for you, but if you need to talk about it, I'm here for you. Thank you. Well, I'll go crash on your sofa for a couple of hours if you don't mind. I actually do mind. <laughs> but apparently our character doesn't mind him being there. I mean, I do. I don't know why we broke up. But I have a feeling. Well, the, the doctor or psychiatrist, whoever we were talking to at the beginning of the game, mentioned that our relationship was tense. I don't know. I don't like this. Maybe Daphne does, but I don't like this. There's like 400 rooms up here. I can't let you sleep on the sofa. I'll set you up in a guest room. Even better! Show me the way. I wake up early the next day. Frank must still be asleep upstairs, and, as I know him, he won't be awake until a couple of hours. I don't feel like getting up yet, so I decide to snug up under the covers a bit longer. When I think about what happened yesterday, and the strangeness of the situation, Frank is currently sleeping in a room next to mine. I can't believe he went all this way just to bring me this letter from Mom. Does he regret we broke up? Is this letter nothing but an excuse to see me again? I was ready never to see him again, not after all we've been through. We met ten years ago. It was so unexpected, we were on completely different trajectories. He was a carpenter, and I was a freshman at the university, science major. I just arrived in town. There was a party and acquaintances. I still didn't know why I was invited. I don't know why I went either. I guess when you're 20 years old, you jump on any occasion to go out. And I suppose the idea of getting out of my student room was enough to convince me to put on a nice dress to jump in on a bus. Frank shouldn't have been there either. He was working on a particularly demanding project, but our hostess had insisted until he had given up and agreed to come. I guess that's what we call fate. Magic operated right away. What came next was very trite. A couple of years later, we moved in together. It was stupid to pay for two flats when we were living with each other all the time. Two years ago, 
We took a step further. Frank's small carpenter business was doing well. My PhD was on track. The question came out on its own. Frank asked me if I wanted to have a child. He was sure of it. He was so sure of everything. With the strength of our relationship, that he didn't want to wait me longer, that it was the right time. I had cold feet at first, objecting that I wanted to finish my PhD first, that we would have to think about it, but he managed to convince me. It wasn't that hard. I loved him more than anything. And I knew that, sooner or later, I'd want to start a family with him. Why wait? We were happy. And then, late in the pregnancy, a couple of weeks before the term, I lost a child. They made me keep this inner thing on my belly until the doctor decided to induce labor. He didn't understand what went wrong. Frank stayed with me at each step. He was holding my hand as I was expelling death from my bowels. The doctor refused to let me see the baby, objecting that it was too much for me to handle. But I saw the look in Frank's eyes when they pulled this motionless and silent corpse out of me. I hung up to him as much as I could, but I could feel this hollowness in my chest all the time. I didn't want to admit it, but I knew something was irredeemably broken. Frank decided to incinerate the body and scatter the ashes, burying the body meant naming it, making it, in a way, exist. And it was much more than we could bear. I was unable to have an opinion about anything anyway. When the first shock wave and the tsunami it created in our lives finally receded, I realized our relationship was doomed. We did all we could to overcome this ordeal, but sooner or later, we had to face the obvious. We broke up without a fight. We both had decided we had enough. Frank kept our old apartment, and I took a furnished flat in the meantime. Then. A couple of months later, the notary told me my grandmother had just passed away and she bequeathed everything to me. I take a quick shower and I go downstairs. Noises from the espresso maker tell me Frank found the kitchen. Mom's letter is still propped on the chest in the hall. I'll have to resolve myself to open it sooner or later. What should I start with? Letter into the kitchen. You know what? Better now than later. I am really curious about this letter. The envelope is dog-eared and a bit yellowed, as if I had traveled a lot. There is a foreign stamp. The ideograms tell me that this was probably posted somewhere in Asia. I opened it with a shaking hand. It's the first news I've got from her since several years ago. Something like, what, five years? Six years ago? I can't remember the last time we talked. Frank has never even met her. She's always been an abusive mother, extremely invasive, but equally severe and freezing cold. When I turned 18, I got a scholarship which enabled me to earn some financial independence which quickly turned into total independence. I could no longer put up with her invasion of my privacy. Little by little, we lost touch. One year, I excused myself from coming for the holidays. The next, I just sent her a greeting card. I started to filter her calls, and one day, the phone stopped ringing. That's how the link was broken and years have passed without me really noticing she wasn't there. When I tried to contact her, she had disappeared without a trace. I must admit I hardly tried to find her. And now, from nowhere, she comes back into my life with this letter. Her nervous, jerky handwriting hasn't changed. The content of the letter, though, is as cryptic as it is brief. Daphne. 
Please don't accept your grandmother's heritage. Don't go back there. You'd only get into trouble. Regards, Sophie Delatois. The closing says a lot about her qualities of heart. I wasn't waiting for your mommy loves you, but well, mom never talked about the time she had spent here with my grandmother at the castle. It quickly seemed to me that something might have happened, but what? I let my thoughts wonder about this as I enter the kitchen. Frank is holding a mug of coffee and he's distractedly looking through the French window. So, you've managed to tame the coffee maker. You know me. Without the daily dose of caffeine, I'm a bit of a zombie. Did you sleep well? Okay, so, to rephrase, since I didn't know the history between this two, pretty much we've, are, we've established so far that they were in a loving relationship, and unfortunately because of the miscarriage, because they lost the kid that... Um, that put a, a really big dent in their relationship and being completely honest that that happens to a lot of relationships but at least now I know I'm confident that there's nothing like negative between them it's just like they have this unfortunate event that they're both in pain from so I'm a little more open to this guy let's see And just like myself, I'm going to answer, I've thought about things. I must admit, I didn't sleep much with you being here. I know, it brings out some old stuff. And you must have guessed, I haven't traveled 300 miles just to play the mailman. I had a feeling your coming wasn't totally innocent. I guess you know perfectly well why I'm here. No need to beat around the bush then. Tell me, Daphne, what do you think? Should we try to start anew together? Mm. This is really sudden. I'm not going to say no. Um, but I don't feel like an outright yes would be appropriate since we're adjusting to a lot of things. If I was in this situation, I would be unsure because I would still be adjusting to a lot of things. I'm going to go with I don't know. I don't know. I need to think about this. Okay, I understand. For me, it's very clear. To my surprise, his face relaxes without notice. He looks at me playfully and changes subject. So, seriously, what have you been doing here all this time? I tell him about my life and everything that went down since I arrived. The Bortines, the Maltairs, this tower with no way in, and this crazy stuff. I mention I'm now a school teacher. I also tell him about Mom's letter. He doesn't know what to think about it either. So, your stories are very exciting. Also a bit worrying, I must say. This is what I propose. Whatever happens, I'll be around for a while. I don't have any contract in the foreseeable future, and I can afford to take a couple of weeks off. After that, I'll see. If I manage to find some jobs around here, I'll stay for a few more months. If not, as anyone's waiting for me to come back, I'm going to give us some time to think about things. Well, I stayed at the castle a couple of weeks until I found a room somewhere else. No, I, I wouldn't mind. I don't think this guy's going to kill me in my sleep. Do you think I would throw you out? Of course you could stay a couple of days. Time you need to get your, your bearings. Thanks! It's not nice to turn me into a homeless person. Don't thank me. It's the least I can do. So how do we make this work? I don't want to be in your hair. No reason to feel crowded. The house is big enough for the two of us. I was just thinking. 
I'll tell the wardens you're you're here before leaving. I don't want Mr. Burton to shoot you like the rabbit if he sees you hanging around the house. That's very reassuring. Don't be silly. They're very nice. You'll see. I've really got to get going. Enjoy your day. You too. I try to put my thoughts in order as I drive to school. It's quite a lot to digest. It really is! <laughs> okay, so... I know we're in the middle of a scene, but this is where I'm going to stop for now. Um, usually when I record these episodes, they're about 30 to 40 minutes, but... I account for that because in hidden object games, you have a plenty of uh, scenes to cut out where I'm searching for items or if I get lost looking for the next puzzle to do, but here I didn't account for that. So um, I'm still going to keep it to about 20 to 30 minute episodes uh, because there is a lot to digest and I have a feeling we have a long way until we get to one of these 60 endings. So, I will leave it there for now. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you later. Bye!